Good morning, family. Good morning, Josh. <laughs> so good to see you all. Why don't we stand? The Holy Spirit is here. And he comes to lead us to Jesus, to honor him for all that he has done. Why don't we stand for the reading of the word today? Yeah, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin since grace, oh, so that grace may increase? Far from it. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the one who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is to never die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once, For all time. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Therefore, sin is not to reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your body's parts as instruments of righteousness for God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Far from it. Do you not know that the one whom you present yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the same one whom you obey, either sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though we were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching that you were entrusted. Lord, I pray we would be obedient from the heart. And after being freed from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented the parts of your body as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now now present your body's parts as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves, you were free. Oh, sorry. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in relation to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in satisfaction, in sanctification, and the outcome eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. celebrate Lord that you would take the wage of our sin we are set free from all that you are from all that you've done by all that you are let's just lift our hands and Welcome him. Honor him.
worthy, Jesus. Worthy, Jesus. You refresh our hearts. we come and lay out before you. We praise Jesus. We praise Jesus.
to your glory is day you call my name our in love the great Lazarus wake up out of the darkness to your glory is day wake you sleeper for great light is come the dawn is come and the night is gone
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to grace. When the darkness goes in sin, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Choose. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be only. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be only. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Choose to bless your name, even if my feelings don't like it. I praise you, even if my feelings don't like it. I will bless your name, God, because blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. there's something really on that it's so easy to praise Jesus when things are good yeah how do we respond when things are hard when he takes away every way. Your love and kindness 
Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living Lord Amen. Let's sing that again. How great the chasm that laid between us. You're the bridge. In desperation, I turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
by my spirit says the Lord not by might not by power by my spirit says the Lord not by might not by power by my spirit says said to the women when they went very early that first morning why do you look for the dead sorry why do you look for the living among the dead he is not here for he has risen he's risen guys we're going to continue to worship but but this is a living hope that we have that we just sung about our hope is not a dead hope some of you might have come here this morning with your hope a little bit dead a little bit still in the tomb a little bit still in the grave but he is our living hope and not only our living hope but the words say my living hope everyone say that my living hope Jesus is my living hope yep so as we continue to worship this morning shake yourself wake yourself whatever you need to do to remind yourself that he's no longer dead why do you look for the living among the dead the angel said he is not here he has risen amen and not only Jesus, but you, like you are alive. You have been made alive. So you too, in the likeness of his life. Come awake. Come awake. I think we should sing verse 3 again. Let's get those words up, Jonah. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. We worship you, Lord.
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to break out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Oh, You turn my night into day. I put on all my heaviness and I put on the garment of praise. You turn my morning into dancing. You turn my night into day.
song So long before our lives To raise a voice
Just keep singing that. Keep singing. And let me remind you of Paul's words to the Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him. Let me read that again. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father this is our Jesus this is the one whom we sing highest praises to this is the one who is worthy to receive all glory, all honour, all majesty and all praise. And so we bring to you, Lord Jesus, our praises. We declare you a God exalted. You are on high. At your name we bow. At your, your name our tongues confess, Lord God, that you are Lord of all. Be enthroned upon our praises. Be enthroned upon our praises this day. You know, that just reminds me that our Lord desires connection with his children. He condescends to us <laughs> for us to know him, that even our praises would enthrone him. This Jesus who came to be known by us, to reveal himself to us, to die on a cross, to be dead and buried in the ground, to take upon the sin of the world to the grave on our behalf. This is our Jesus. This is the one who emptied himself, took on the nature of a servant, of a slave, and humbled himself to a death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him. And so this morning, Lord, we bless you. We praise you. We exalt you. And you guys get this full well that, that praise can be loud and praise can be the stillness, the soft whisper of our abandonment, our surrender to the Lord God. We sung before, blessed be the name. 
Blessed be the name He gives and takes away. And, and I'll just remind you again, the Hebrew word to bless also means to praise. Barak. It carries with it a picture of kneeling, of coming in stillness. So just for a few moments more, just for a few moments more, just continue to give him his highest praise. Just keep it on the low down. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Jesus who died, Jesus who now lives again forever, give us a fresh revelation this morning of not only the cost, the price that you paid, but the life that you have made for us through the empty tomb. Give us a fresh revelation this morning, we pray, of this resurrection lifestyle that you call us to. That you have made us alive together with you. Lord, I just pray for every one of my brothers and sisters in the house here this morning, anyone watching on live stream, who are still in the pit of despair, who are still in the unfinished work, who are still in the unresolved issues, who are still in the hopelessness and the darkness of the death and of the grave, who are still in the silence of the Saturday, Lord God, I just pray, Father, for, for anyone here this morning, Lord God, we bring to you the unresolved issues of our lives. We bring to you, Lord God, the circumstances that have not yet made way with this resurrection lifestyle that you call us up into, Lord Jesus, and we ask for a fresh revelation. Speak to us, Lord, by your word, by your spirit this morning. Come and speak to the deepest part of our lives, Lord, and bring transformation, we pray. Bring new life this morning, just as new life burst forth from that tomb on that first resurrection Sunday. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Well, I just want to welcome you here. If you're visiting here for the first time, if you wandered, wandered in because it is Easter Sunday and you've come to church, our prayer for you is that you would experience the presence of the risen King Jesus himself. He is alive and he loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love. We've got the kids in today. And so this is going to be good. There's some activity books. If your child would like some activity books out there on the table in the foyer, there's some pencils as well that they can engage in as, uh, as I preach the word in a little while. Isn't it cool to have a full team on stage today? Thank you, work team, for leading us. It's been powerful. It's been beautiful. All right. Well, before I do bring the word, 
Uh, we've got a video for you to have a look at this morning. Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity. Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line between old and new, between death and life. There stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. Isn't that awesome? It's not about our story. It's his story. It's his story. That's why we come. That's why we worship. That's why we celebrate. But wonder upon wonders, this God who crafts his story into history invites us to be part of his story. There's no part of our lives that remain untouched from his story. Even, even to that, you know, be enthroned on our praises, that line and that, that psalm that says he's enthroned on the praises of Israel, that he condescends to actually be enthroned upon the praises of his people. Just such is his love. He always seeks connection with you. He's always seeking connection with you. We say that, see that through the life of Jesus. We see that in the Last Supper as he washes his disciples' feet, as he agonizes in, in the garden. And on, on Thursday night, we had a, a beautiful time of, of contemplation and worship and, and silence as we really spent time entering into with Jesus the agony and, and the fact that he suffered. And we so often as, as believers want to, you know, fast forward to the resurrection, to the victory and forget that Jesus had to go through this huge suffering and he did that for us. He did that for us. He's always seeking connection. And then again, just, I mean, I'm just reminded again of the resurrection narratives in the Gospels. And go and read them if you haven't read them already yet this Easter. But go and read the four different resurrection narratives and notice the similarities. Notice the contrasts. And, the, and I just love the place where the angels have, have appeared to the women and they've told them that, you know, that, that Jesus has risen and go, go and tell the disciples. And they're leaving the tomb. And it's almost like Jesus can't help himself. And, you know, just appears before them. And this is Jesus. He's always seeking connection. He's always seeking relationship, engagement with our hearts, from his heart to our heart, 
because he loves because he loves and so please don't miss the love of the father through jesus christ this this easter i know you won't i just want to share some thoughts this is resurrection sunday easter sunday the day in our calendar when we particularly remember that jesus has risen from the dead it happened as an event a historical reality go ahead and throw that up for us please jonah and going well we'll have you out of here a little bit earlier this morning because i know that there's families and there's kids in the room so we'll see how how we, how we um, travel today. I want to talk about some resurrection realities. And just to remind you, this, these words from Nicky Gumbel, the resurrection of Jesus is rooted in history, grounded in scripture, and confirmed in experience. It's not some wishy thing. It's not some fairy tale. It's rooted in history it is an event that actually happened and how do we know that it happened well we won't go fully into it but the abs the absent tomb the tomb is empty in 2000 years no one has been able to provide a body or bones or remains of jesus in fact all who have tried to disprove the resurrection have turned around and come back and gone you know what i cannot escape the evidence that that there is no body that jesus has risen from the dead it's grounded in in scripture and we know we hear in scripture of the appearances of jesus all four gospels tell us that jesus the risen jesus appeared to his disciples over a period of 40 days and paul tells us in first corinthians 15 that at one time he appeared to more than 500 500 people at once and Paul's basically saying to the Corinthians of the day he says some of them are still alive and so if you if you've got any questions about it to the Corinthian Christians go and ask them because they've seen the risen Jesus it's grounded in scripture it's confirmed in experience and we see the the transformation in the lives of the disciples especially who went from these cowardly um, you know, men who, who ran away in the garden when the tests became too much. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, they went from hiding in the upper room after Jesus had been crucified out of fear. They went from those sorts of guys within 50 days to be fully transformed, the Holy Spirit living in them and proclaiming the truth of Jesus' resurrection, the day of Pentecost, to thousands of people you know people who'd come to jerusalem for that festival preaching that jesus was crucified he was dead he was buried and three days later he rose to life go ahead go and relook at the messages the sermons of the apostles in the book of acts and it all centers around the resurrection of jesus and as paul says again in first corinthians 15 if there's no resurrection then we are to be pitied more than anyone else all right it's not just that we follow jesus and it's a good life no if there's no resurrection if jesus hasn't been raised and if we're not going to be raised then guess what we should be pitied we're actually a bunch of sad sacks but we're not because he is risen amen yeah so this morning i really i want to just kind of dig into this a little bit look at at what this means and and really just to look at the writing particularly of, of Paul, the Apostle Paul, and I encourage you to go back and read the, the narratives of the Gospels around the resurrection again. But today I want to give you a three-pointer talking about the resurrection realities. I'm going to talk about the supremacy of Christ, the completeness of Christ, and the, the perspective of Christ. All right? So um, there you go. You know where we're going today. So that's good. We're going to jump straight in here. If this works with the supremacy of Christ he is the firstborn and Paul writes to the Colossians he says he is the image of the invisible God he's talking about Jesus by the way the firstborn of all creation for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things were created through him and for him and he is above all things and in him all things hold together and he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead 
that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And that is a mouthful and a mindful, isn't it? Just that paragraph. We could spend weeks just on that. But just let me just drill down very simply that he is the image of the invisible God. You know, Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus replied, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is what we can see of God. He is God revealed to us, the ultimate revelation of God. In fact, the, the author of Hebrews says that in the past, God spoke through prophets. But in these last days, he'd spoken to us through his son, Jesus. Jesus is what we can see of the Father. And so if you're searching for God today, there's no need to keep looking. Jesus is it. He is the supreme one, the supremacy of Christ. Once you find Jesus, you know, that's why Christians can appear narrow-minded to people who are searching spiritually. Oh, you're so dogmatic. You're so narrow-minded. No, it's just that I've found the supremacy and his name is Jesus. His name is Christ. I don't need to keep looking for spiritual guides or, or realities or, or mysteries or, or mystical ones. Christ is it. I've found him and I don't need to keep looking. He is sovereign. He is the name above every other name, as I read before from Philippians. And look at this down here. He is reconciling to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. You know, again, I'll tell you, the cross was not an error, a misstep or a loss. It wasn't that the cross was, was when Jesus was defeated and the resurrection was when he had the victory. No, the cross itself was a victory. I remind you again, the cross itself was a victory. Let me read to you from Colossians 2 from verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's the whole intent of Jesus going to his death on the cross was so that men and women from all nations would be brought near to God by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Listen to this. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. That's what Jesus has done. And I just realized that I'm reading from the wrong book. <laughs> I'm going, this isn't what I was talking about, but that's one new man, and that's an excellent thing to read. That's Ephesians 2. Let me read to you from Colossians 2 right now, which is where I thought I'd open it up. All righty, you're awake. That's good. Here we go, the cross. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of our trespasses, passes by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Listen to this. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Yep, it's through the cross that Jesus triumphs the rulers and the authorities. Sometimes we look at the death of Jesus and we go, well, that's when Satan had his way. No, that's when the Lord God had his way by the offering a, a, sin, a sinless sacrifice, the, 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 the spotless lamb of God offering, offered for the, the whole world so that we might be brought near to God. And that puts the rulers and the authorities, the principalities and the powers to shame. The cross puts them to shame. It's not a loss. It's not a defeat. And so this is the supremacy of Christ. He won at the cross and he won again at the empty tomb. It's like a double whammy, double barrel shotgun. Boom, boom. Take that, devil. You're gone. You're done. Yep, sin is dealt with at the cross. And eternal life is brought to us through the empty tomb. 
And he is the firstborn. It means that there are others. You know, a firstborn in a family means that there are siblings that follow. Yeah. So his resurrection points to your resurrection. Yep. Okay, let's motor on here. Here, the supremacy of Christ is the completeness of Christ. He is not only the firstborn, but he's the first fruits. And uh, let's have a look at this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul writes, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Again, another mouthful and a mindful, but Paul here is contrasting the first man, Adam, with the second Adam, who is Jesus Christ. And he says that death came to us through a man, through Adam, as he took, as he sinned in the Garden of Eden. Death came to the human condition. Yep, so we're in it. As soon as we enter this world, guess what? We're born into a sinful world, a sinful condition in which we need a second Adam. We need a saviour. And that's why Jesus came. For as a man came by death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. First the physical, then the spiritual. The separation brought by Adam is annulled. It's ended. It's dealt with through Christ. It is completed. He, it is the completion of Christ. And uh, I remember, I mean, a few weeks ago, you guys remember Rabbi Jason Sobel came and, and preached an amazing word and, and connected a lot of what we know from the garden and from that experience of Adam with what Jesus, let me remind you of some of what Jason said. And this is the second Adam, Jesus, annulling all that the first Adam sinned with. Uh, Adam ate from a tree. Jesus was nailed to a tree. Uh, Adam introduced the curse, yeah, and, and a picture of that curse was by thorns and by thistles. You shall work the land, Genesis 3 tells us. Jesus literally took the curse upon himself as a crown of thorns was placed on his head. Adam stretched out his hand to take the fruit in an act of rebellion and self-willed autonomy. Jesus stretched out his hands to receive the nails in an act of selfless sacrifice and obedience. Adam shirked his responsibilities and blamed others, whereas Jesus fully embraced his calling and responsibility as the Lamb of God given for us. Adam is the physical, Jesus is the spiritual reality and his completeness points to our own. And even as we are born into this condition that Adam set up way back in the day dot, this sinful world, and we are all marked by that, none of us is innocent, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Just as all of us have gone through that, all of us then must come under Christ. We must surrender. We must come and submit to the second Adam, to Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection for ourselves. That he died and he rose again on our behalf. This is a central message of the gospel story. And if you're hearing this and if you never made that faith step, today is a good day for that step. Today is a good day to say, yes, I see that. I know I'm sinful. I know that I've been walking in brokenness and I need a saviour. I need someone to set this right on my behalf. I can't do it for myself. Religion can't do it. Works can't do it. We need a saviour who steps in on our behalf. And Jesus has done that for you. If that's you today, you need to make that step. Come and we're not going to make you do that in a, in a public, in a stressful way. But talk, if you've come with someone today, talk to them about it. Ask them to lead you in this step. Come and see me after the service. If you're on live stream, make a comment. Reach out. Say, I want this for myself. 
I want this reconciliation, this resurrection life for myself. I'm sick and tired of doing it my way. He is complete. His completeness points to our own. And as I shared on Thursday night from 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins. He did it once for all. He did it once for everybody. The righteous for the unrighteous. To bring you to God. He did it to bring you to God. And, and, and as we said last week and again on Thursday night, so often we, we, we read these words and we hear that and we go, Aha, yes, I'm forgiven. My sins are forgiven. There's a transactional reality that takes place here. His righteousness for my unrighteousness. And we leave it at that. We pray the prayer and we go on living our merry lives. So yeah, I became a Christian. I accepted that. But what, what Jesus did for us is so much more than just a transaction of righteousness. So much more than just forgiveness of sins. He did it so that he would bring us to the Father. Now that our sins are dealt with, our sins are, are wiped clean, we don't just you know, live our own lives, but we live in restored relationship with the Father. I shared on Thursday night that, that just coming with a transactional mindset is like someone you know, paying my mortgage on my house, but then me still not choosing to live there. I don't owe the bank any more money, but I'm choosing to live out in the street. No, Jesus has died so that not only are your sins forgiven, but that you can come into his house, the household of faith, that you can be restored in right relationship with the Father. Lord God, the creator of all things, because he loves you. And we're motoring, guys. That's two points out of three done. And you guys are going, you beauty. We're going to be out of here in no time. But I, I just want to hang out on this third point for a little while, if that's all right. We'll see how we go. Ha, ah, set you up, hey, Steve. The, th the third thing here is the resurrection reality is that we, we are called into a perspective of Christ. He's not only the firstborn, the first fruits, but he becomes our first filter. And these, these words here from N.T. Wright, New Testament theologian, just, just sit with this for a moment. He says, Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. That, after all, is what the Lord's Prayer is about. That's why Jesus came preaching, the kingdom of God is here. He's proclaiming the kingdom of God because it's here and now. And the Lord's Prayer, you know, thy will be done, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That heaven would become our first filter, our first reality. And, and what, does, what does a filter do? Well, if a filter modifies um, our experience of something. We have an air filter to improve the quality of our air. We have a water filter to improve and to clean up the water that we drink, right? Uh, a camera has filters that go on its, on its lens to change what we see. We have audio filters. We have filters that, that change the way that we experience something. And here's the deal. We either view Jesus through the filter of our circumstances or our circumstances through the filter of Jesus. So often, our view and our understanding of Jesus comes through our circumstances, comes through the lens of what we, we feel. We can be prone to viewing Jesus through the filter of our circumstances. So for example, if I, if I experience loneliness, I might view Jesus as being distant or uninterested in my life. If I'm constantly under pressure, or busy, I might believe that Jesus expects me to always be stressed, to always be in the grind. We tend to view Jesus through the lens of our circumstances, but Scripture challenges us not to do that. Scripture challenges us to view our circumstances through the filter of Jesus. And the resurrection, the resurrection must be our first filter. The resurrection must be our first lens that we see our, our circumstances, our life, our experiences 
I just want to drill down with this with a few verses from Ephesians. And again, Ephesians is so rich, so rich in theology and truth. There we go. You see, the resurrection of Jesus points to our own future resurrection, that we will be resurrected just as he has been. He's the firstborn. He's the first fruits. But it's also for now. It's also for now to, to change our, our, our view, our filter, our perspective right now, that we have the perspective of Christ. Here we go. Blessed be the Lord, God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. This is a now thing. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Then he goes on with his great pastoral prayer, and we touched on this last week during worship. Paul's praying that they would have the eyes of their hearts enlightened. He says that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Look at these three things. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us, who believe. Do you remember us touching on that last last week during worship? Hope, glorious riches, uh, inheritance in the saints, and immeasurable greatness of his power. According, then Paul ties these things to the resurrection. According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Okay, so the power of the resurrection, the power of God at work in Jesus as he raised him from the dead is at work in you. It is at work in you. And it brings, and the prayer is that it would bring hope to which he's called you. Glorious inheritance and immeasurable greatness of his power, that that would be evident in our lives. It's the first filter for our lives right now. And then he goes on, and he put all things under his feet. That is, God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And again, it's a mouthful, it's a mindful, but let me just drill down here. Look at this. God, the Father, put all things under Christ's feet, gave Christ rule and authority dominion over all things and Christ gives it to the church which is his body and in some inexplicable wonderful marvelous mystery the body of Christ the church capital C well guess what we represent the fullness of him who fills all in all now we're going to get into some deep some deep waters in a moment because, you know, like you, my circumstances don't often really look like the fullness of Christ is going on right now in my life. Am I right? Okay. What, how can this be? But this is the reality. This is the perspective of Christ as he sees us. Let me move on into the next chapter. Because look at this. This is what Paul goes on to say. He says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, three, three verbs here I want to look at. Made us alive together, raised us up, and seated us with him. These three verbs in the Greek are, are what they call, well, they're compounding verbs. There's two verbs at once going on here in the Greek. And, um, and the, the, first, the, first, um, the first verb is this together, with him, yeah. with him, together. And obviously it means it's, it's actually together. We often look at the resurrection and say, God has raised Jesus. But here's the truth. Here is the, the perspective of Christ, that he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus can just just sit there for a moment that the perspective of Christ the resurrection reality according to God is that you have been made alive with him you are alive because he is alive and not only that 
but you have been raised up with him. You read the Gospels and the number of times this word is used when Jesus is healing people. Stand up, rise up, get up. It's the same word, rise up. It comes from the Hebrew word kum that Joel often preaches on. Awake, arise, get up. You have been raised up because he is alive. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about the tense of this verb in the Greek. It, it talks about a single completed action of the past. A single completed action of the past. You have been seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you're saying, hang on a minute. I'm sitting right here in row four, you know, in the middle, in this room at Flame Tree in Nambour, here on the Sunshine Coast. How, how can I be seated in the heavenly places? Well, it's the perspective of Christ. This is his perspective. And, and we are called to take on him as our first filter and not look at our circumstances and then judge Jesus, but to look at Jesus and then judge our circumstances. And, and like you, I have days, I had one just yesterday, where I did not feel like I was seated in the heavenly places. In fact, it's very rare <laughs> that that's a perspective. But, oh, gee, I want to take this perspective on a whole lot more. Not denying, you know, reality. You know, not being so heavenly minded to be no earthly good. But being so heavenly minded that I must be heavenly minded in order to be earthly good. You understand what I'm saying? It's his perspective. It's his perspective that we take on when we realize that we are, this reality is that we are seated with him in the heavenly places. And so now we can view our circumstances accordingly. It may not change your circumstances, although some of your circumstances may change. But it changes your perspective, your filter, according to Christ's filter, his perspective. And Paul, in, should we become, you know, quite puffed up or quite, you know, encouraged or confident about this? I'm seated in the heavenly places, by the way. Paul's very careful to say more than once, it is by grace you have been saved. And he goes on, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God. Not as a, a result of works so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for beforehand that we should walk in them. And I want to just kind of land in here on this final verse, verse 10, that we are his workmanship. Some of your translations will say handiwork or masterpiece. We are his masterpiece. We are his handiwork. We are his workmanship. The Greek here is poema, from which we get the words poem and poetry. Just think about that. that. You are a poem in the eyes of God. That you are a masterpiece. You are a work of art in the eyes of God. And the late Timothy Keller said this much better than I ever could. So let me just share you his words. Do you know what it means that you are God's workmanship? What is art? Art is beautiful. Art is valuable. And art is an expression of the inner being of the maker, of the artist. Imagine what that means. You're beautiful. You're valuable. And you're an expression of the very inner being of the artist, the divine artist, God himself. You see, when Jesus gave himself on the cross... He didn't say, I'm going to die just so you know I love you. He said, I'm going to die. I'm going to bleed for your splendor. I'm going to recreate you into something beautiful. I will turn you into something splendid, magnificent. I'm the artist. You're the art. I'm the painter. 
You're the canvas. I'm the sculptor. You're the marble. You don't look like much there in the quarry, but I can see. Oh, I can see. And they're beautiful words. And so let's, let me just pause for a moment as we've been talking about these great thoughts and great depths of, of, of theology from the Apostle Paul and these mysteries that he's putting into words that we grapple to understand and, and grab hold of. It's all because God sees you as his masterpiece. It's all because God has designs on you and wants to design in you something that's going to bring him great glory and praise, something that's going to be beautiful, something that is not only something of splendor, but it is splendid. This, you know, this should just wipe away any notion that I, I made it just by the skit of my teeth. You know, some people, you know, they've been forgiven of their sins, but man, you should, you know, you, didn't, you don't know me. And I'm just scraping into the kingdom of God because there's not many worse like me. I'll tell you what, no, this, this, this wipes that away, that thought. It should wipe it away totally that God not only loves you, he's not only died for you so that you can come to be in his presence, but he's died for you and he's risen again so that you can be the full grown, the full formed masterpiece that he intends you to be. <laughs> Just let that truth sink for a moment. Get some freedom in that. And again, we don't go jump straight to like, oh, I must be something really special then. Yeah, you are special, but it's by grace you've been saved. This is a gift from God. Don't get, you know, don't get the cart before the horse. It's only through Jesus that it's because he loves us so much. Charles Spurgeon likened this, this, this word workmanship to, uh, to an artist with a palette of colors. And on a palette, you know, the colors, artists will tell you, they can look quite messy. And how can something beautiful come out of those colors? But in the hands of the painter, as he applies it to the canvas, a work of art is brought about. J.B. Phillips summarizes it like this. He says, each of our lives is the canvas on which the master is producing a work of art that will fill the everlasting ages with his praise. These are the works that he has for us. We are created to do good works. We're not saved by the works. We're saved by faith through grace, but we're saved in order to do good works. And God, as the artist, as a craftsman, as the designer, the engineer, he knows us better than we know ourselves. We can trust him not to put square pegs in round holes. Relax and trust his plans. These works are not for us, but for his kingdom. Again, straight after the resurrection narratives, in all four gospels, we move quickly to Jesus commissioning his disciples. I've done all this, I've died on the cross, I've risen again, spent some time with them. And now he says to the disciples, post-resurrection in all four Gospels, now go and do what I've done in you. As I've taught you, as I've trained you, now you go. It says it like this, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And we're all familiar with Matthew 28, the Great Commission, which my paraphrase will be, in your going, as you're going, make disciples. Make disciples. Teach them what I've taught you. Baptize them. Teach them to obey everything that I've taught you. What I've done in you, in other words, these good works or these masterpieces that God is creating in you, what I've done in you, reproduce your faith in others. See that it gets carried on. That's part of the beauty of his handiwork. So, resurrection realities. The supremacy of Christ, the completeness of Christ, the perspective of Christ brings us new life. Because he is alive, we are alive. Brings new identity. As Paul says, that if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. And a new purpose. May you find a new purpose this day. Trust the craftsman. Follow the risen Jesus. Reproduce faith in those around you and walk in resurrection realities daily. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you that this is truth. No one can take away that Jesus came, he lived, he died, and he rose again. We thank you that this truth, his story, becomes our story by faith. And Father, would you teach us to walk in these realities, Lord God. Lord, teach us to recognize and receive the supremacy of Christ over all other voices in our life. Lord, may we know the completeness of Christ. Lord, those words that Jesus spoke from the cross, it is finished, it is complete, it is done. Lord, because he has completed, Lord God, that we would know that we are complete in you and in this gift of life, Lord Jesus. And may we adopt your perspectives more and more, we pray. Lord, help us to live as we are made alive with you, as we are raised up with you, as we are seated with you in the heavenly places, give us your perspective. Lord, may you be our first filter. Even, even among difficult, challenging circumstances, Lord, we surrender to you. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. Lord, let your resurrection reality become more and more of our story each and every day for your glory, that these masterpieces in this room, that these, these works of art, Lord, would portray your glory, would give you glory, Father God, that others may see, that faith may be shared, that disciples may be made, Lord God, that your kingdom may be expanded here on earth until you come again. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.